Hey guys, my name is Atif Shanawaz. I'm an internal medicine doctor and I make videos going over medical topics, explaining them in layman's terms. So if that's something you're into, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about the causes of heart failure, but before I get into the nitty gritty, let's quickly make sure that we're on the same page about what heart failure is. Think of the heart as a simple pump. The job of the pump is, well, to pump blood around the body, and when this pumping action is not working quite right, heart failure occurs. And this is a pretty simple yet accurate definition of heart failure. Now, in case you're curious, I made another video linked here where I go over the symptoms of heart failure and why they occur, so check that out if you haven't already. Now, as complex as the heart is, there are actually many ways and many mechanisms through which the pump stops being effective and they can all lead to heart failure. But today, we're going to be going over five of the most common reasons that the pump fails, and altogether I would say that these five causes account for the vast majority of all heart failure cases. So chances are, whenever I encounter a patient with heart failure, they will very likely fall into one of these five categories. So let's get started. The number one cause of heart failure by far is due to something called ischemic cardiomyopathy. Now let's break down what that means. Ischemia is a general medical term that means a poor blood supply. So if you have ischemia of the gut, we call that mesenteric ischemia, a blockage of an artery that supplies an arm or leg is called an ischemic limb and so on. Cardiomyopathy basically means that something is wrong with the muscle of the heart. So ischemic cardiomyopathy refers to a heart that is not working right because it is not getting the blood supply that it needs to do its job. Now let's be clear about what we mean when we say a poor blood supply to the heart, because the heart has a lot of large blood vessels associated with it. You have the inferior and the superior vena cava that deliver blood to the heart from the veins above and below the body, you have the pulmonary arteries and veins that move blood between the heart and lungs, and you have the aorta, which is a huge artery that goes on to supply oxygen-rich blood to the entire body. Almost every artery that you have heard the name of is actually a branch of this artery, the aorta. Two of the very first branches that the aorta give out are the right and the left coronary arteries. And when we're talking about a poor blood supply to the heart, it is the coronaries that we're talking about. In the face of chronic inflammation, the coronaries get stiff and they get narrow, making blood harder to move through them. Less oxygen is delivered to the heart muscles, and as a result, the heart doesn't beat effectively, potentially resulting in heart failure. Now, chronic inflammation happens to all of us. The question is really one of degrees. Healthy people with good genes and lifestyles will have very little inflammation of the years, and they can live long, healthy lives without any of this inflammation ever having a significant impact on their coronaries. However, smoking, as well as diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, the use of drugs, especially the stimulant kind like meth and cocaine, as well as bad genes, will speed this inflammation up and increase the chances of clinically significant coronary artery disease. So another way of putting this is as follows. That the most common cause of heart failure, which is ischemic cardiomyopathy, is in itself caused by years of poorly controlled diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, drug abuse, and bad genes. Now, another common cause of heart failure is drug-related. The United States, as you may know, has a serious problem with methamphetamine abuse, with over a million Americans using the drug at least once a year. The excessive stimulant effect of meth causes the heart to wear out, and in time it stops pumping as effectively as it used to. Now, I'll tell you that meth can also accelerate the chronic inflammation of coronary artery disease that we just talked about, so it can cause heart failure by that route as well, but methamphetamine is also directly toxic to heart tissue, and it can weaken the heart just by acting like a poison. Cocaine, by the way, has this exact same kind of effect, but it's not as commonly used as meth. Now, besides meth and cocaine, another very common drug that causes heart failure is alcohol. And just to be clear, we're talking about alcohol abuse, which is heavy drinking every day or nearly every day for months or years. Heart failure does not occur from the occasional glass of wine or weekend trips to the bar. We're unclear about the exact mechanism through which alcohol causes heart failure, but we suspect some kind of direct toxicity of alcohol to the heart tissue itself. Now, it's not uncommon in patients who developed heart failure from stimulant drugs or alcohol for the heart muscle to recover once these substances are stopped, although I have personally seen deaths caused by severe heart failure in meth users and alcoholics because their addiction beat them, unfortunately, before they could beat their addiction. 
Diastolic heart failure is another type of heart failure that I see all the time. The term comes from the word diastole, which is a fancy word that refers to the relaxation phase of the heartbeat. So diastolic heart failure refers to some abnormality with respect to the way that the heart is behaving between its beats. By the time a person is 65 years old, the heart has beat a total of about 3 billion times. And for many people, the heart can continue to function just fine as they get older, but in some, the heart begins to show signs of aging. And one of these signs is a stiffening of the heart muscle. See, the heart muscle needs to be somewhat elastic. And the reason is that when a heart finishes a beat, it has to be able to relax enough to allow blood to fill it back up again. In a healthy, perfectly elastic heart, the blood floods inside and fills it up really nicely. So when the heart is ready Ready to beat again, it has plenty of blood inside to pump out. But imagine what would happen if the heart muscle didn't relax enough. If it didn't relax enough, it wouldn't allow enough blood to come in. And if there's less blood coming in, there's less blood going out, which ultimately leads to the same problem, which is heart failure. I usually only see diastolic heart failure in older patients, usually over 65 years of age, although it can definitely happen in somewhat younger patients as well. Now, stiffening of heart tissue is more or less a natural part of aging. So a 90 year old will definitely have a less elastic heart than a 20 year old, but many elderly folks won't have any symptoms at all because the heart isn't so stiff that symptoms necessarily develop. Now, obviously the worse the stiffness is, the more the chances are that it will lead to heart failure. And factors that we've noticed that could potentially worsen the stiffness in elderly people are poorly controlled high blood pressure, smoking, obesity, and a sedentary lifestyle. But in my practice, I've seen diastolic heart failure in patients without any of these issues. And I do suspect that there's probably also a genetic component at play here. Next up are issues with bad valves. Now the heart and the large vessels leading in and out of it have valves. And like all valves, everywhere they function to keep fluid moving in a certain direction. And if these valves aren't working right, the fluid dynamics within the heart is altered, meaning that blood isn't moving through the system in an efficient way. Now, there's a bunch of valves in the system, and they can all fail, and they do, but by far the most common valvular condition that we see is something called aortic stenosis. Now, remember that aorta that I talked about earlier, that large blood vessel that delivers blood to the whole body? Well, it's got a valve. It's called the aortic valve, and in some people over time, this valve gets tighter and narrower with age until it becomes so small that very little blood can be pumped through. Severe aortic stenosis is said to exist when the area of the valve is less than one centimeter squared. In other words, all of the oxygen rich blood that the body needs to survive is being forced through an opening no bigger than one centimeter by one centimeter, which is not really a lot and which easily leads to congestive heart failure symptoms. Now, when heart failure develops because of aortic stenosis, the valve must be fixed because the average life expectancy of patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis is about two or three years, so it's a very serious problem. Now, patients who have aortic stenosis, they tend to be older because it takes time for the valve to narrow like this. So they're usually at least in their late 60s, but this problem is so serious that patients who have symptomatic aortic stenosis will get a valve replacement surgery even if they're in their 80s or maybe even their 90s if they're otherwise healthy. Now, another situation that I see heart failure caused by bad valves is in IV drug users. Every time IV drugs are injected, there is a risk of injecting bacteria along with the drugs. The bacteria will move around in the circulation, and one of the places that the bacteria likes to set up camp is a heart valve. The bacteria grow and multiply around the valve, and they basically eat the valve alive. And in this case, the problem isn't so much a tight valve, like with the aorta, but an incompetent valve. And what this means is that because the valve is being eaten up, it will let blood leak backwards, making the heart far less efficient, and again, leading to symptoms of heart failure. Viral infections are a common cause of heart failure. Now, in this situation, what happens is that the virus infects the body, and it infects many parts of the body, including the heart muscle. This infection, when it occurs, causes so much inflammation that it causes the heart muscle to lose strength and heart failure symptoms develop. This condition is called viral cardiomyopathy. Now, let's make a distinction here because while heart failure caused by IV drug abuse is because of an infected valve that is rendered incompetent, viral infections of the heart is a different kind of infection altogether. Besides the fact that one is a bacterial infection and the other is a virus, the other thing to remember is that 
While IV drug abuse requires the individual to inject themselves with the drugs, heart failure from a viral infection can just happen to anybody. Anybody can get it at any time, even if the patient is actually healthy, and it usually does affect younger people, generally in the range of about 30 to 50 years of age. We've identified many viruses that have been known to cause heart failure, and some of these you may not have heard of before, like parvovirus B19 and Coxsackie virus. Maybe you've heard of another one called the Epstein-Barr virus, but it can also be caused by just the influenza virus and even by HIV. So a patient may come in and the only symptoms they'll have are cold-like symptoms or bad flu-like symptoms where everything is hurting. They may have respiratory issues as well. And then a couple of weeks later, they may develop symptoms of heart failure. And we only realize after the fact that the flu-like symptoms were actually part of a larger disease that was also affecting the heart. Now, the prognosis is also somewhat variable, with about half of the patients making a full recovery a few months later, but in the other half, the weakness of the heart muscle is devastating and is permanent. And a lot of patients in this category of heart failure end up eventually getting a heart transplant because they are already on the younger side anyway, and a heart transplant allows them to live a normal life without having to deal with heart failure for the rest of their natural lives.